I've said it before, but my favorite part of those worship services are the hand motions, right? <laughs> so much fun. Um, this morning actually marks our halfway point through our Hebrews sermon series. And sometimes halfway through a series, we kind of lose focus and forget, what, what is all this about? And so one of the things that happens maybe with TV shows that we watch is that oftentimes, you know, we turn on that TV show, it's been a week since we've seen the last episode, and they often start with one of those little recaps, those, those few first minutes, kind of recap what's happening in the story, where everything's at. And this morning, we're going to start today's message with a similar little recap. We're going to hear a little bit of what we've seen so far this sermon series. And it all starts with the ancient setting of this book. Where does this story take place? What's going on when this book is written? And in the case of the book of Hebrews, persecution is rising. Every week I've mentioned this, you can almost feel it rising, right? Because you've been hearing it every week. Persecution is rising. Political and social pressure are escalating. And in general, that pressure is being faced against Christians to try to get them to turn away from their faith, to lay aside those core teachings of what they believe and who they believe Jesus is. When this book is written, Christians are being targeted for their faith. It's becoming costly to be a Christian. During this time, if you were found out to be a Christian, maybe your friends would disown you. An employer might coincidentally need to make some layoffs. Tensions are rising. Hostility is escalating. It's no longer a season of let bygones be bygones. It's a season of search and destroy. Persecution is mounting, and that's the setting. That's the context of this book. And the author speaks to those who find themselves at the blunt edge of that hostility. The author writes this letter to those who are beginning to experience that hostility, and there is a core truth that shapes this entire book. One core truth that the book essentially is trying to get across. It wants that truth to penetrate our heart and soul. And this core truth, this one core truth, is that Jesus is greater than anything else in the world. Jesus is greater. And as we've been following through this series, maybe you've been following along, and week by week you've seen as the author expounds upon that core true message and what it means. Every week that idea that Jesus is greater has become more and more real. It's slowly been working its way into our hearts. Week by week, chapter by chapter, we've seen that Jesus is greater. And then Jesus is greater and then Jesus is greater. I'll throw up a slide on the screen that shows the basic flow of this book of Hebrews. We've seen this every week. It kind of helps orient us of, of what this book's, how it's structured. How do we approach this book? The first 11 chapters are essentially teaching. They give us information. And then the last two chapters are application. They really are full of action items. How do we take this teaching and apply it? And if we were to break down that teaching section a little bit further, 11 chapters, that's a lot to swallow. If we were to break it down a little bit further, there are four main teaching points to this book. And if you've missed a recent episode in the last few weeks, uh, you can catch up on those four points and where we're at in previous messages. You can catch up on those with our new church website that's actually coming out at the later part of this week. It'll be launched, so look for that. But today... We're actually focusing on one particular aspect of those four teaching points. We are looking in particular at this idea that Jesus is greater than a priest. Jesus is greater than a priest. And roughly that's chapters 5 through 7. And this section of teaching is, is pretty straightforward. If we were to kind of figure out what's going on through this section, I've thrown some of the verses up there, a little timeline, a little outline for you. Building up to chapter 5, there's two verses that are kind of a transition. They're the edge where the food kind of touches and the two ideas kind of mold together. So we've got a little transition, and then we get chapters 5 and 7. 5, 6, and 7. forgot about 6. And really this starts with the question, how? How is it possible that Jesus is a priest. 
He's, he's not from the tribe of Levi. How is it that Jesus can be a priest? And once we establish Jesus' priestly credentials, the author moves on to show that Jesus is the ultimate high priest. That's kind of the flow of this chapter. This section of teaching is pretty straightforward. Except, except, there is an exception. In the middle of this section of teaching, there is an interruption. An interruption occurs. The timeline kind of breaks and goes in a different direction for a small section. And at first, this interruption seems to come out of the blue. And as we'll see, the placement of this interruption actually makes a lot of sense, what the author's doing and what he says. And an interesting factoid to maybe whet your appetite, to get you ready for that interruption, that interruption in chapter 6 of Hebrews is the most contested, controversial passage in all of the Bible among Bible scholars. Ooh, that interruption says a lot. So we're going to uh, skip over it. <laughs> no, no, we'll take a closer look at that section. But our general game plan for this morning, it has two steps. First step, we're going to figure out what it means that Jesus is greater than a priest. We're going to walk through this section of Scripture, chapters 5 through 7, and we're going to skip over the interruption at first. We're going to focus on that priest idea. And then step two, once we understand and have a good feel for this section of teaching as a whole, we're going to go back and look at that interruption. So we'll skip it at first. I was, I was partially telling the truth, but we'll come back to it at the end. So instead of dealing with the interruption in the very middle of this message, we're dealing with it at the end. So let's start by reading the beginning section of teaching, that transition part that starts off this idea that Jesus is greater than a priest. And we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. So this is such a beautiful passage, this section of Hebrews chapters 5 through 7. But some of the concepts of this passage are a bit foreign to us. We don't live in an ancient system where there's priests and high priests and temples and sacrifices. This idea of the priest and high priest are maybe a little bit unfamiliar to us. Maybe even hearing that word priest it starts to maybe wonder in us and we start to come up with this question, uh, Michael, aren't, aren't you a priest? Nope, I'm not. I'm a pastor. There's a big difference. See, a priest is someone who stands as a middleman between you and God. They're a middleman. And in last week's message, we talked about how approaching God's glory, it's like taking a spaceship and traveling to the sun the solar system sun. And as you get closer to that hot sun, it's a giant ball of burning gas, it's super hot, the spaceship kind of starts to melt, right? As you draw closer and closer to the glory of the sun, its power overwhelms us. We can't handle it. If we look out the window, we go blind. As we travel close to the sun, it starts getting dangerous. The power and glory become too much. It's too much for us to handle. Now, in the Old Testament, God called specific people and specifically equipped them, and God gave them this special suit that essentially made it so that they could, they could draw close to that heat, like a heat suit that protected them 
Maybe you've seen it before. They're kind of foily and they, they guys go on volcanoes with them, right? God gave them this special heat suit so that they could draw close to him, hopefully, without dying, right? These people God called and specifically equipped were called priests. These priests acted as a middleman to the general public. So for an example, imagine in ancient times or in ancient days, and I'm just a normal guy, right? I can't get super close to God without dying. I can't get close to the sun. I don't have a heat suit. And I have this request or this gift that I want to give to God. Well, I would give it to a priest and they would put on their heat suit and then go into the temple and draw close to God to give that sacrifice or that package or that message to God that I I wanted them to give. Hopefully this priest concept kind of makes sense. A middleman. I'm not a priest because I'm not actually a middleman. You don't need a middleman. In this passage, it explains that each of us are called to boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. I'm a pastor. It's also called a shepherd, same word. And I don't stand between you and God as a middleman. I stand beside you and we approach the throne together. So that's how a priest works. They put on that heat suit, as it were. So how is it that the priests are made holy? How is it that they put on those heat suits? Where did, where did that special thing that they have come from? How are they made holy so that they can approach God's holiness? How are they made perfect and blameless so they can approach a perfect and blameless God without being blown away? The, police, the priests themselves, after all, they would recognize that they are not perfect. They know they are sinful and broken. They realize that if they were to approach God's throne, they would literally die. And so the priests, what they do is they offer a sacrifice. Something else dies in their place. Something else takes on their guilt and pays for it for them. And here's the kicker that causes a bit of a conundrum when it comes to this idea of a priest. Are you ready for this? If the priests are middlemen, right? The priests themselves need to make a sacrifice to be able to put on their hot suits. They need someone to make a sacrifice for them. But they're the middlemen. Do you see where there's a bit of a conundrum here? The priests themselves need a middleman in order to become the middleman to the general public. The priests themselves need to offer a sacrifice to God. They need to approach God and be able to give him something so that they can be made pure and holy and put on their heat suits to help others. So what's the solution? What happens? Well, the priests need a higher priest called a high priest, right? They really were convenient with the naming. And the high priest helps the lower priests to make a sacrifice. The high priest represents the whole nation of all of God's people. The high priest becomes the linchpin. This particular person becomes the linchpin if we are ever going to be able to approach God. Verse five, or chapter five, verse one explained it. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. So the high priest enters this place called the Holy of Holies on behalf of all the regular priests. And it's kind of a trickle-down system, right? The high priest helps the priest become holy and the temple to become holy, and then they're able to help the people. The high priest becomes the linchpin if we're ever going to be able to approach God. But some of you maybe are starting to scratch your heads and wonder. You're starting to see the conundrum, the glaring issue take place. The high priest themselves are not inherently absolutely perfect or holy. This Levitical priesthood, the priests have sinned. Who will be the middleman for the high priest? Well, uh, um, maybe the high priest will offer sacrifices to make themselves holy? Wait, that makes no sense. That doesn't work, right? We need a 
higher high priest. And now you're starting to understand why Hebrews chapters 5 through 7 are so powerful. It's the basic idea. We need a higher high priest. The author is trying to get you to see that Jesus is the higher high priest that we've needed all along. So jump with me to the very end of this section. It's the very end of chapter 7, chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. And essentially, I just did the build-up for you all through that passage, and here's the punchline of the passage. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death has prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, ironic, right? And then for the sins of the other people. He, sacrifi he sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. The whole priestly religious system implodes without a perfect high priest. So just to recap the main point of this section of teaching, Jesus is that greater high priest. Jesus is the higher high priest, the priest above the priests. So we've got a picture of this section that's unfolding. And this week, one of the things that we're challenged with as we go through this Hebrews series is to go back through the, during the week three or four times and read through this section, this passage. And as you do go back and read through this section, there is going to be a very confusing name that will appear over and over across this chapter. If you're reading it this week, the author will demonstrate to us that there are this Levitical priests they're all the sons of Levi. That's where they get that name. Levi's priests. But none of them are perfect. None of them meet the holy standard. Perfect. Holy. But good news. There is another lineage of priests. Totally different from Levi. They're not Levi's sons. Instead, this other priesthood comes from this guy called Melchizedek. Melchizedek. That'll be a name that's brought up over and over and over and over in this section of Hebrews. Why is it so important? Why is it so significant? And it might not be obvious at first, but here's a key point that'll help you unpack this idea of Melchizedek. Just realize what the word Melchizedek means if you translate it. The word Melchizedek literally means king of peace. The king of peace. The author actually explains that to us. He says it and gives us one of these little wink, wink, wink. You know what Melchizedek means, king of peace, right? Because the author wants you to see, we need this eternal priesthood that is founded upon the prince of peace. That is our only hope. The whole priestly religious system implodes without that perfect priest. Quite a powerful section of Hebrews to reflect on, especially when you come to the realization that the entire Old Testament, right, over and over he's referencing the Old Testament priesthood, was built around this linchpin. They all saw it. And Jesus has become that perfect high priest, been revealed to be that perfect high priest, almost as if it was the plan all along. So hopefully now we see better how Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than any other priest. Designed that way. Revealed that way. It's a neat section to go through. And now comes the time for the interruption. This happens right in the middle of the whole discussion of the, the whole priesthood, the high priest debacle. The author breaks away from his train of thought. He pauses everything. He hits the pause button and starts this interruption with these words. They're from Hebrews chapter five, 
verse 11. We have much to say about this, this thing we're talking about, but it is hard to make clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's words all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Where did this come from? Well, the author of this book has been telling us over and over and over that Jesus is greater. In fact, he's been telling us how Jesus is, is, is greater than even the high priest. And then the author stops. The author pauses for a moment. And here comes the conviction, right? He says, you've heard from almost a month now how Jesus is greater. But is it sinking in? You've maybe heard similar messages your whole life. You know, we know Jesus is greater. The majority of us knew that before we even started this series on Hebrews. But is it sinking in? We hear these words on Sunday. We say, yep, yep, got it. Makes sense. And then Monday through Saturday, we live like Jesus isn't actually greater. We live like money's greater. We live like pleasure's greater. We live like power and fame are the things that are greater. The author interrupts this message to call us out, right? If Jesus is actually greater than anything else in this world, our life is about to change. We will never see anything in this world the same way. Oh boy, watch out. We haven't even made it to the controversial section, section, right? What else happens in this interruption? All right, let's hit it. The most controversial passage in the entire Bible. Hebrews chapter six, verses four through six. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. For some of you, this passage maybe doesn't seem very controversial. It means what it says. Yeah, of course. Part of the controversy around this passage, it kind of stems from this debate in Christian circles over whether someone can actually lose their salvation. There's some who would say, if, if you were saved as a child, you'll always be saved, no matter what, no matter what you do. Once you're saved, you're always saved. There were others who would enter this conversation and say, if you were saved as a child and then, and then you turned away later on, maybe in your young adult years, it means you were never saved in the first place because it would be impossible to, for you to turn away if, if you were saved. And yet others, if they would say if you were saved as a child, you need to continue to walk in that faith that saved you. Salvation is conditional on receiving it with faith. And so salvation can be lost. And these are some of the points of controversy with this passage. There's actually quite a few more that Bible scholars kind of nitpick about. But there are a few words in there that are alarming, right? Impossible. Loss of faith. Crucifying Jesus all over again. My personal opinion with this passage, and there is much debate, and I could be wrong, but my personal opinion with this passage is that there is no grammatical evidence in this passage, that it's hypothetical, that it's conditional. And what I mean by that, there is no, if someone were to, you know, turn away from their faith, as if it couldn't happen. That's not what it says. The words that literally read in that passage, it is impossible for those who have. It's 
not conditional on, well, if maybe this is, this is something hypothetical, it can't really happen. The grammatical structure of it says that it is impossible for those who have had the real deal experience with Jesus and fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Yikes. But if you really think about this warning and what it's saying to us, it kind of makes total sense, at least. If someone has really had more than just the head knowledge, more than just knowing information, if it has penetrated their heart, if they experience the power and working of Jesus in their life, if they experience the genuine real deal and reject the real deal, what is going to convince them to come back to Jesus? What could, maybe if we explain to them better in clearer words the gospel, will that convince them? They've experienced the real thing. Maybe, maybe if they experience an extreme working of Jesus' power in their life, maybe if they experience Jesus' power in their life, but it explains that they've already experienced that. They've already done that, been there, done that, and they reject it. The, what do we do? There is some merit to this warning passage. Now, I know, hmm, do I know anyone who fits this passage? Have I ever experienced this, seen it, this happen with anyone before? Honestly, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if I've ever seen someone who has had the real deal turn away from it and reject it. That's a hard question to answer. I have personally discipled young adults who grew up in the church maybe made a commitment when they were a child, and then in their teen years and young adult years, they turned away. In fact, some of them openly professed, I am an atheist, I reject Christianity, those words. And I've discipled them and seen them come back to the faith. And they made some interesting comments. I still remember some of the comments. They said things like, when I was a kid, my faith wasn't really my faith, it was my parents' faith, and I rejected my parents' faith. But now, this experience is, is, is my faith, and it's different, and their life's been changed. So as we think about this passage, there's part of us that maybe get concerned. Family members, friends, there are people that come to mind and alarm us with this passage. It is impossible. Oh, no. Ah. Keep praying for them. Be bold. Keep praying for them. Don't give up hope. There is merit to this warning, but there's still hope in those situations because we don't know exactly what's happening in their heart. We don't know exactly where they're at. Now, changing gears just a little bit. Do you remember the setting of this book? I explained it at the very beginning, right? It's the political and social pressure to turn away from Jesus. There's growing hostility. It says, turn away from Jesus. Turn away. But think through that picture with me. There's pressure that says turn away, but where would you turn? What other priest in this world are you going to turn to? Maybe we'll go back to the Jewish high priest who wasn't even perfect enough by himself. All the other priests in this world are their own middleman. They have to offer sacrifices for themselves because they aren't good enough. Jesus' claim is that he is so perfect, blameless, and holy that he isn't just the perfect priest. He's also the perfect sacrifice to make us blameless. If you were to turn away, where would you go? What, what, what prophet would you turn to, right? We looked at that last week. What prophet would you turn to? All the other prophets in this world claim to hear and, and listen for words from God and tell them to us, right? Jesus' claim is that he is God speaking. As we think about this warning, as we think about these words that we've seen through Hebrews so far, if these words aren't true, if there's no high priest, if there's no greater source, 
this hostility that is escalating. Man, I could see where someone would turn away. But if Jesus is greater than anything else in this world, if those words are true, where else would we turn? Nothing even comes close to what we see with Jesus. Go back to the high priest, go back to the sacrificial system. Ah, the linchpin's pulled out. It comes crumbling down. Jesus is greater than anything else in this world. He's the only one we have to turn to. Okay, I have one key application point. One key application point to tie this whole message together for us. The application point is that we are, we are called. This week we can do this. We are called to approach the throne with confidence. Approach the throne with confidence. Hebrews 4.16 said it to us. Let us then approach God's throne with confidence, throne of grace with confidence, so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The Jewish high priest would have trembled as he entered the throne room, as he entered the throne. He would have trembled entering the Holy of Holies. They tied a rope around his ankle of this high priest, right? Because sometimes they would go in there and just, they'd die. They couldn't make it. Too close to the sun. And all the other priests outside would be standing around saying, that was the high priest, right? Who else are we going to send? Who else is greater than the high priest? You got to drag the body out with the rope, right? No one else can go in there. But we do have a greater a higher high priest, a prince of peace. Jesus wasn't just the perfect priest, he was also the perfect sacrifice. And now he has finally made you holy. He has torn down the barriers. We can confidently approach the throne. But there's a difference between approaching the throne with confidence and approaching the throne with contempt. Here's a little illustration to maybe help you understand what it would be like to approach the throne with confidence instead of contempt. A student throws a ball through a glass window in a classroom. And the student is sent to the principal's office, obviously. And as the student approaches the principal's throne, right, his big wooden desk, he's standing behind it. If that student had contempt... In this situation, that student might say something like, the principal has no power over me. The principal won't actually do anything to me. In fact, it doesn't really matter what I do. Big deal. I got sent to the principal's office, right? What's he going to do? He just tells me don't do that and turns around and leaves. That would be contempt for the throne. But confidence would be approaching that throne and saying, I did mess up but the principal is my friend. I know the principal wants the absolute best for me and that he would go out of his way to help me. He cares about me. When we approach the throne with confidence, we can approach it with confidence because he has compassion for us. In this case, this illustration, that principal would open up his wallet, pull out cash and pay to fix the window for us we can approach his throne with confidence because we know who he is. Last week, I said to start your prayer time by focusing that Jesus is present with us. Start your prayers focusing how Jesus is, is here with us. He's not distant. This week, I would say start your prayers by reciting Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 that says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can boldly approach God. We can boldly find help in our time of need. By the end of this week, I hope you'll actually memorize it if you say it enough times. 
It's powerful. It's part of how that truth sinks into our heart. Approach the throne of grace with confidence this week because of your great high priest. Let's pray. Father, sometimes, sometimes we're, we're intimidated to approach you in prayer. Maybe we had a bad day, a bad week. Maybe we haven't read our Bible. Maybe we haven't been to church in a long time. Maybe we feel guilty. Maybe there's part of us that knows that we're not worthy to be at your throne. We have a great high priest who has made us holy. We have a great high priest who has boldly opened the door for us. We have a great high priest that has made a way for us to approach you. It finally makes sense. It's not sacrifices I offer for myself to try to make myself holy. It's the sacrifice that you offered to make me holy. Give us confidence this week to approach you in prayer. No matter what mess-ups we had, no matter what kind of day we've had or week or month or year, let us have confidence this week to just pray and reach out to you. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.